Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Lister Family Engaged Science three-minute thesis competition. My name is Ingrid Chiraz. I'm the project administrator for the Office of Student Academic Services. Today's event is supported by the Lister Family Engaged Science Initiative. It provides science communication training to McDonald campus students, as well as different opportunities for students to apply the different skills that they develop, such as this competition. We would like to thank Mrs. Lister and family for their contribution, their support, and their commitment to the initiative and to our students. I'd like to start the event with a line acknowledgement. The Ganyan Gehaga Nation are the custodians of Jojage, the unceded territory on which McGill University stands. They're also the custodians of the surrounding lands and rivers. To the south reside the communities of Ganawagi, and to the north, the communities of Ganesetagi. We thank you for watching over these lands for so long and for continuing to watch over them today. We have nine students that are gonna be presenting their research in three minutes with only one non-animated slide. Our judges for this afternoon are Dr. Jean-Benoit Charon, Associate Dean, Graduate Education at the Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Miss Jasmine Music, a PhD candidate in Animal Science and the first place winner of last year's competition. Dr. Catherine Panuco, who's a professor at the Department of Biology of John Abbott College. I'm now gonna let our event moderator, Dr. Andrew Churchill, who's the Presentation Skills Training Manager at Teaching and Learning Services, to introduce our first competitor. I don't need any applause. <laughs> but as I introduce our students who have worked so hard to, to, for this evening, um, we can give them a round of applause. So we'll save our applause for them. Um, we'll have a 30 to 45 second break between each speaker so that our judges can take some notes, but we're gonna move right along. Our first speaker tonight is Derek Alate, and the title of his talk is From Pea to Burger, Addressing the Issue of Taste Sustainably. Who amongst us here had burger for lunch today? Okay, imagine you're a vegan and you try your first bite of a pea protein burger that is the party made from pea proteins. You were excited, but then you had a shock of your life because the taste was unpleasant, unappealing, and you vowed never to go that line again. This is not just a major issue or conundrum for vegans, but millions of dollars that was invested into artificial meat production are all going down the drain because of the simple but yet critical issue of taste. The two causative agents are one, what I call them the beta fibers that try to attach themselves to the proteins when they are being separated from the other components of the plant. The second thing is that these protein isolate themselves are unfriendly. That is, they are not able to bond with the different ingredients like flour, water, oil, and sugar whilst making the artificial meat. And that our taste buds become the ring where they settle their differences when they are forced. So the complexity of this protein fiber interaction makes it difficult for us to predict the right condition that would help us target the right taste. Are we able to now deploy the powerful capacity of AI and digital technology to kill these two birds with just one stone? Yes, and that is where my research comes in. My research focuses on developing a digital version of the P protein separation process. Just the way your social media algorithm works. It tries to look at the videos you like and tries to create patterns. This algorithm I will create will try to understand the different portions of the interactions from the fiber and the protein and try to relate to the conditions we use for the separation process and relate that to the final product. And again, with the social media, TikTok or Instagram, once in a while, it just tries to suggest a video to you to see whether you like it or not. Sometimes you tap, sometimes you skip. The same as this digital version. It tries periodically to do the how well do I know you test 
by trying to predict an outcome, send signal to the physical process and see whether they'll find the actual results in the physical process, whether there'll be a replication. It does this continuously till it now behaves exactly as the physical process. And we call that the digital twin or the clone of the physical process. And this one helps us to now manipulate the conditions in the digital version without going through the physical process that would take several years and also can be expensive. We will now manipulate the conditions to find the right amount of conditions or the right timings and temperature that will give us the right taste. What is the big deal if this is successful? Improved taste promotes consumption of the plant-based protein, promotes sustainability, and finally, once again, putting your shoes in a burger, in the, in the shoes of a burger, you try the taste and there will be a beaming smile showing love and satisfaction and inclusivity. Thank you. Derek, you saved me. I was supposed to do that. <laughs> Thank you. We'll next hear from Maria Nahib, who will be talking about the evolutionary odyssey of Legionella. Do you know about a bacterium that lives in water systems but cause disease when you inhale it? Let me tell you about this weird type of bacteria, which is known as Legionella pneumophila. It thrives in water systems and then transmitted to humans through water droplets and as a result causes a severe form of pneumonia which is called Legionnaire's disease. Another interesting thing about this bacteria is that it evolves so quickly and develops resistance against control methods. There are different methods which are used to control it, its growth in water systems and chlorination is the most common one. However, the problem is we do not know what are those, those mechanisms that are making resistance over time. So here comes my research. I am interested to identify those genetic factors that are making it chlorine resistant. We know that in water systems, it lives in association with other microbial communities and can acquire resistant genes through horizontal gene transfer. So in order to answer this question, we have developed a cool technique which is called experimental evolution through which we can evolve bacteria in the lab for a long period of time. So I have two systems which mimics the natural water systems. One is controlled without any treatment and the other one is under continuous chlorine treatment. For the past six months, I have been growing Logionella with other microbial communities and every week I uh, collect water samples and then store them at minus 80 degrees C. So at the end of the experiment, I will be able to revive those evolved microbial populations and then check their resistance against chlorine. Next, I will extract their genomic DNA and then sequence them through high throughput sequencing techniques. The information obtained will help to identify those genetic factors, making it chlorine resistant. For the next part of my project, I will grow those evolved mi microbial populations within natural host cells such as amoeba, which are in the environment, and human lung, uh, lung cells. So I will be able to uh, see if this uh, chlorine resistant making is more disease, um, increasing its disease causing ability with time. So overall, the long term goal of my project is to uh, get the information and help the operators to improve their uh, control methods in the water systems as well as develop new strategies to control Legionella growth in water systems without making it more resistant over time. Thank you.
The next researcher we'll hear from is Shada Reze, and the title of her talk is The Icy Journey of Humidity, The Cool Science of HVAC Snowmaking. Do you feel warm and nice now? Do you know what's the reason behind that? It's all about the HVAC system on top of your head. Now we are in November, but over summertime, it feels cool. And that's the cooling system, what I'm going to talk about it today. Cooling and heating are two separate topic, but honestly, cooling is a bit more challenging because over cooling, we have to deal with both moisture and temperature. Have you ever wondered how this HVAC system works. The general process of HVAC system is like that. It absorbs the hot and moist air from this room and shoots it to another part of the system to absorb moisture and reduce the temperature. But this air flow would be so chilly to come out. So that's why we need to warm it up again to be desirable enough in terms of temperature and moisture and we enjoy it in this room. But sometimes there are too much moisture in the room and the load that's applied to the system is out of range. So it can cause some problems like mold, mildew and leaking as you can see in this slide. And electric systems are not a really big fan of moisture. They don't want to mix with moisture. I found a way to separate moisture from them. The idea inspired from nature, like what we see in snow, clouds, and sky. So I have built a model, which is a visible transparent bubble. And at the heart of it, I put a really cool thing that we call it a cold plate. So hot and humid air comes in and face with this cold thing and it absorbs the moisture and turn them into ice crystals. So the outcome would be cold, dry, icy fog or even icy cloud. Most people don't like hail, but I love it because it's not any more liquid and it couldn't cause damp walls, mold for me. So as a solid, I could easily get rid of it from the system, but it was just half of the story because I could also create energy from these ice crystals. So not only I solve moisture problem, I also save money too. How amazing the mother of nature it is. Thank you. Our next researcher is Mehetab Singh, and he will be talking about making oats punctual. Being health conscious isn't just a trend. It's a lifestyle choice that has an optimistic effect on your well-being. And in this trend, Oat is an emerging cereal for healthy lives with a Canadian consumption of 2.34 metric tons last year. From the first crunch to the last satisfying spoonful, 
oats offer a breakfast experience that's tasty, nourishing, and convenient, setting you up for a great day ahead. It's also rich in soluble dietary fiber, beta-glucan, and various other antioxidants, which are good for your body, your heart health, and your overall well-being. But however, this precious cereal is facing adaptability challenges in Canada due to repercussions of climate change. Despite being a temperate cereal, harsh Canadian winters present an insurmountable problem for oat cultivation in Canada, and, and hence only the spring oats can be grown. So we are left with a short span for oat cultivation because harsh Canadian winters can be a problem. There can be hail storms and there can be frost damage later. So my goal is to develop early maturing high yielding varieties for agroclimatic conditions of Canada and the yield is a really important factor. With our collaboration with Agriculture Food Canada, we have a candidate gene in mind, VRN3, which can do this job. It's associated with flowering time, and certain alleles of this gene have been found to delay the flowering time by five days, which is a significant number, because further delay in crop harvesting can lead to frost damage, which is not desirable. So we want to precisely tweak this gene using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology to expedite the oats flowering by playing with the reproduction and other mechanisms and make the oat punctual. As you all might be aware, this is a basic CRISPR-Cas9 system consists of two components, one of which is a guide RNA that acts as a torch to find your target sequence, while other is the Cas9 protein, which acts as a pair of scissors to cut the sequence, leading to the loss of function mutant. And hence, we'll have the expedited flowering time, which is suitable for agroclimatic conditions of Canada. I have already produced my transgenic lines, which are happily growing in the greenhouse, and will be screened for generating events in the next generation. And finally, these generated plants, which will have diverse phenotype in terms of flowering time, can be used by Canadian oat breeders to produce the oat lines which are suitable for their respective provinces. And I'm doing this so that you can continue to experience the nourishment of warm oatmeal bowl during the snow winter mornings, which fuels your body and satisfy your taste buds. And I don't see any harm to add a berry on the top. Thank you. Anybody hungry? <laughs> it's amazing the diversity of research here at that campus. Next up, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ruth Sitiane. And she will be talking about, sorry, I'm gonna do that again. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Ruth Sitiane and I, she will be talking about beefing up soil carbon through manure application, creating cleaner manure for a greener world. Canadian farmers have been using land applied manure for centuries. Long-term application of manure not only increases soil health and crop productivity, but it also increases the soil organic carbon that is critical for climate change mitigation. Here's the good news. Application of manure reduces the over-reliance of chemical fertilizers from fossil fuels and the diminishing phosphate mines. Even more good news, we have plenty of it. Canadian livestock produces over 146 million tons of manure annually. However, here's the bad news. Manure management is the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural practices. I am going to use the DNDC model to estimate the greenhouse gas mitigation potential for manure application under different cropping systems in Canada. Researchers globally have used DNDC model to simulate the 
carbon and nitrogen cycling in terrestrial ecosystem. I'm focusing on the carbon. There are ongoing efforts by researchers from agriculture and agri-food to further develop this model for Canadian suitability. My research will further develop this model so as it can be able to simulate the manure emissions because little focus has been placed on developing this model to simulate from different types of manure application. How I will revise this, I will revise the decomposition model in the, of, of the, of, so that it can represent the different decomposition rates of the different types of land manures and even biosolids. I will be working closely with researchers from agriculture and agri-food to use the historical data sets from field trials across three provinces, that is Quebec, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. I will use data sets of soil properties, crop, weather data, and fertilizer details to calibrate and validate the improved version model. After model verification, we will be able to further improve the trends of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly the carbon dioxide. Consequently, we will be able to, to account for the national estimates from the contribution of these greenhouse gas gases to the national inventories. Further to this, we will be able to simulate the best management practices that can integrate crop, livestock, and manure. And with that, we can optimize nutrient cycling within and between farms. Lastly, this is a win-win situation for people and environment in which all life depend on. Thank you. Our next researcher is Arusha Fleming, and she will be talking about what gets bacteria up in the morning. Bacteria are not that different from you and I. What you see on the left is me on a snowy Montreal morning where it's quite cold. The bacteria that I'm studying aren't that different from me. The issue is that when they get cold, they go to sleep, but then they don't show up with the way that we normally use to detect them. Now, this is particularly concerning as I'm working with a foodborne pathogen, Campylobacter jejuni to be specific. So this means that if you're in the food industry and you have a food sample, and you were to put that food sample in the fridge. Then after you test that food sample, because the bacteria are asleep on it, they won't show up on the test that we're reliant on to detect them with. And then that means that they think it's safe, but that food product could make its way to people like you and me and potentially infect us. So what my thesis is on is what gets this bacteria up in the morning so that we can find a way to detect it. Now, I'm going to be talking about what I have been using to wake them up in the morning as an alarm clock, and then I'll let you know later what exactly that alarm clock is. So, how have I been testing this? First, I take my bacteria sample, and then I put them in the fridge, just like you would in the food industry. After I use the same test that they use in the food industry, to, and make sure it doesn't test after a certain period of time. After that, then, I use my alarm clock and test the alarm clock's reliability. And so then I use the same test and see whether it shows up on that test or not. Now, let me tell you about how reliable this alarm clock is. So one, it has been able to detect my bacteria in very low concentrations. Two, it has been able 
to detect my bacteria very quickly. Up to 90% of the samples that I have tested have been able to be detected within 12 hours, and it has only gotten better after that. Three, able to detect my bacteria after they have gone to sleep for quite a long window of time, up to four weeks. So now that you know about how reliable this is, what exactly is it that gets bacteria up in the morning? Well, you can see on the right-hand side, it has been right in front of you this whole time. It is an egg, and not just any kind of egg, but a fertilized chicken egg, to be exact, with my bacteria. So now that we know what it is that gets this bacteria up in the morning and how reliable it is, we can hopefully use this knowledge to be able to detect the bacteria if it's on a food product so that people like you and I can eat our food in peace. Thank you. Anybody less hungry? Because we don't have that test yet. <laughs> Next, we'll be hearing from Tungzu Meng about why bitter matters. As the most popular drink in the world, I think we are all somehow familiar with coffee. So let's get a quick show of hands before we begin. Please raise your hand if you don't like coffee. Raise your hand if you like coffee only when there's enough sugar or milk. Raise your hand if you like your coffee black. Okay, as we can see, our preferences in coffee are vastly different. And it isn't just about coffee. The same thing also applies to vegetables that are healthy but quite contentious in terms of taste, such as broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and kale. What's the one thing all those foods have in common? They all taste bitter. Well, you may think, nah, they don't taste bitter to me. That's because you're less sensitive to bitterness. And this is the result of different genetic makeup in our bitter taste receptors, which have led us to have different sensitivities towards those bitter tasting compounds in those foods I just mentioned. Currently, we know that we can sense bitterness in our um, by the bitter taste receptors in our oral cavities. But there could be other genetic variations in other genes that we haven't discovered yet. And my project is to figure that out by conducting a genome-wide association study that aims to uncover novel genetic variations that are associated with bitter tasting food preferences. In order to do that, I use the current data from UK Biobank. Genetic data were collected through a usage of microarrays, which are tiny plates but can assay around 800,000 genetic variations in the human genome for several participants at once. And this was done for over 120,000 participants. They were also invited to complete a questionnaire which asked them to rate 144 food items in the degrees of liking. And then we will pick some well-conceived bitterness, uh, bitter-tasting food, and then construct a score in the terms of, in the like in the degree of liking they have rated. And then I will run millions of statistical tests to see if every single genetic variation is associated with the score we have just created. The results will be also be replicated in the UK Biobank or other big national data set to see whether those genetic variations we have identified are associated with the bitter tasting food intake. From there, if the associations are confirmed, we are very confident to say that the genetic variations we have identified are associated with the bitter tasting food preferences. Therefore, it will allow us to further explore the role of genetics played in the process of bitter foods liking and food choices. Thank you.
I had to take a moment and tell you a quick story. We all learn a lot as we listen to these talks. I used to kind of think I was a little better than people who had to have milk and cream in their coffee because I could drink it black. And that all changed when I learned that it was just because my bitter taste buds don't work very well. <laughs> so this, our, this um, sense I used to have with my spouse, it kind of shifted a bit. <laughs> all right. Next up, we will have Olivia Clapp, and she is going to be talking about spilling the beans on soil carbon sequestration. Globally, our soils store four and a half times more carbon than trees. Yet, they're so rarely talked about as a strategy for carbon sequestration. And this is because we simply don't know enough about them. Understanding more about how our actions are impacting the soil will allow us to develop new carbon smart soil policies. This is of particular importance when it comes to our agricultural practices, as agriculture is a major emitter of carbon. Currently, the major way of reducing this is through implementing new technologies and field management practices. But what if we could do this just by shifting the varieties we grow? Now, plant breeding has revolutionized our bean crops. We've seen improved disease resistance, drought tolerance, and have increased our yields by an average of 12.9 kilograms per hectare per year since 1909. We know we're improving the above ground characteristics of our crops. What we don't know is the impact that this is having on the soil. To address this question, I'm gonna be studying carbon sequestration and carbon metabolism in common bean. The process of carbon sequestration can be seen on the slide. This is when atmospheric carbon dioxide is captured by the plant during photosynthesis. This carbon then travels through the plant to the soil, to, and the roots release some of this carbon into the soil. To study this, I'm gonna be using a method known as a decadal genetic gain study. These are commonly used in plant breeding to assess the impact a particular trait has had on breeding, but have yet to be used to look at carbon sequestration in common bean, despite it being eaten by any other legume. My study will grow 300 varieties released across the past 90 years. Physiological measurements will be taken on each of these varieties that will highlight any changes to the crop's photosynthetic efficiency and water use efficiency. I'm also going to be taking a range of soil health measurements. These, whilst informative on their own, can also be used as a proxy to measure soil carbon storage. All of the varieties I'm going to be using will be genotyped. This will allow me to look for genetic sequences that are linked to the impact a particular variety is having on the soil. If any of these sequences are found, they could be used to screen new varieties before release. Having this knowledge could allow plant breeders to ensure they only release soil-friendly plant varieties. It could also help to shift breeding away from a process that only focuses on above ground characteristics to a process that focuses not just on the whole plant, but also on plant environment interactions. In today's world, we're talking more and more about the importance of developing climate sensitive agriculture. But in order to do this, we need to be looking at plant soil interactions, as these represent a vital piece of the puzzle when it comes to lowering our CO2 emissions. Thank you. Our next researcher will be Jillian Cameron, and she will be talking about Evolve, Rinse, Repeat, the Evolution of Copper Resistance in Legionella pneumophilia.
Legionella nemophila is almost 2 billion years old. But as a pathogen of amoebas, it hasn't really been a problem for humans, at least not until the past 50 years. Legionella causes Legionnaire disease, a severe form of pneumonia with a 10% mortality rate. It spreads to humans when water droplets containing the bacteria are aerosolized and then inhaled. Now, nature doesn't aerosolize water very often, but we do. Our engineered water systems, like air conditioning and even showers, create the perfect growing environment for amoeba and the Legionella that infects them. Copper silver ionization, the process of using metal ions to kill bacteria, is one method for Legionella control. Copper is great at killing Legionella. Well, it's great at killing most Legionella. We're starting to see the development of Legionella strains that are resistant to this treatment. But why? Well, copper pipes and engineered water systems act as a selective pressure on the bacteria. Over time, these bacteria evolve to become resistant to copper and are able to survive treatment with copper silver ionization. When some of the genomes of these resistant isolates were analyzed, it was found that they differed from their copper sensitive counterparts in the same water system by only 29 individual nucleotides. So how are these strains becoming resistant to copper? That's where I come in. Hi, my name is Jillian. I'm a PhD student in the Fauché lab, and I hypothesize that copper resistance in Legionella emerges the result of the accumulation of individual point mutations in response to persistent exposure to copper. To find out if this is the case, I am generating copper resistant lineages of Legionella in the lab in a process known as experimental evolution. I grow up cultures of Legionella, I wash and resuspend the bacteria in water, I expose the bacteria to copper, and I grow the survivors. I will repeat this process dozens of times, exposing successive generations of bacteria to increasing concentrations of copper ions, until eventually I will have copper-resistant lineages of Legionella. I will then sequence and analyze the genomes to identify any mutations that may confer copper resistance. To confirm the effect of these mutations, I will induce each point mutation into the ancestor of the evolved lineages. I will then expose the resulting mutants to copper to examine the effect that point mutation has on copper resistance. Infections with Legionella are increasing worldwide, meaning it's more important than ever to find ways to limit the spread of Legionnaire's disease. This starts in the engineered water systems. By understanding how copper resistance emerges in Legionella, we can more effectively de deploy metal-based methods of bacterial control, preventing people from getting sick and avoiding the development of resistance in the first place. Thank you. And that concludes part one. But I'd like to invite all of our speakers to stand and give them a big round of applause again. <laughs> I always get a little nervous before these competitions, and I shouldn't, because you're fabulous. <laughs> um, the judges are going to leave us for a little while. So we invite you to, <laughs> we, we invite you to go and deliberate and wish you good luck because I have no idea how you'll decide. <laughs> and Ingrid, I think you have a few things to share, words to say. Smiles, look at that. <laughs> you have that. Uh, for your information, these are all the credits for the images that the students use for their slide. Uh, now we're going to put you guys to work. So anyone attending in person or in the live stream, uh, you get to vote for people's choice. There is a QR code on the slide. There's a short link. So we strongly invite you to go vote for your favorite talk, the one you found the most dynamic, the most interesting. You get to pick. The link is going to be open for the next five minutes. After that, it's going to be closed, and we're not going to let you vote anymore. Uh, while the judges deliberate, uh, there is going to be a Q&A period with the competitors, moderated by Andrew. So you'll be able to come up and ask any questions that you want to ask. Our presenters seem to want to vote, so we're going to let them vote too. <laughs>
I see them snapping their QR codes. <laughs> I'm going to invite the, judge, the um, speakers to come up here. We have lots of chairs. I'm going to leave this mic with you. Who has a question? No questions. There we go. First brave questioner. Um, hello. Um, I have a question for the getting the bacteria up in the morning presentation. I don't remember your name. I'm sorry. Um, and I cannot see it from here. It's too far away. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> pretty cool presentation. Congratulations. Um, I was very curious regarding the egg. Like, that's what gets the bacteria, like, super excited. But what is it about the egg that gets the bacteria, like, pumped up? So that's actually what one of my colleagues in the lab is trying to figure out. So she's doing a further study to try and find out, like, what exactly, what nutrient in it it could potentially be that would wake them up. Otherwise, it's just that... Um, you know, they were in the cold before, and so when they're in a warmer environment inside of the egg, it could be that. But all we know is that um, it needs to be an egg that has a little embryo of a chicken inside of it to get it to work. But thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, my question is for like Bitter of Matters. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, so, yeah. So, my question is, do you think, like, the same genetic, uh, same genes would, like, control the bitter we feel from, you know, coffee, kale, everything? Or do you hypothesize, hypothesize that they would be, like, different factors from your study? Uh, no, they won't be the same, because they have different um, bitter-tasting compounds in those different food categories like coffee, um, like alcohol, they're like more from like beverage uh, category versus the vegetables, they're more um, coming from the vegetables cat category. So they use different bitter tasting compounds to um, activate different bitter tasting receptors. And um, that's more based on the bitter taste receptors, but we are trying to see if there are other gene genetic variations in different like area, like in different genes are associated with the bitter tasting preference. It's not just about the bitter taste receptors. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I have a question for the same presenter. That's me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you, like me, have a Chinese mother. Um, 
and that as a kid you were told to eat all your bitter vegetables because that would be good for you and it was good for you to you know eat bitterness right true cool mm -hmm. um how do you plan on correcting for sort of genetic and cultural confounders in your uk biobank data set um so we we didn't actually control for the environment part but to, um, we sort of just only um, use those Caucasians as the sample size so that kind of create a same culture background thing um, in the UK Biobank because majority vastly of them are um, Caucasians and they kind of share the same um, food environment yeah, uh, in the UK area but um, if we are wondering that uh, genetic variations are also um, um, associated with the bitter taste preference in other cohorts, we can use different cohorts, like cohorts come from Asia, come from Japan, come from Korea, so uh, we can do a multi-ethnicity uh, GWAS association study to confirm that. Thank you. Other questions? How about another round of applause? <laughs> Those never get old, do they, when you're sitting there? <laughs> how, about a, how about a favorite moment from the presenters in this journey? We can maybe just pass the mic down the row. Shada, you might have to start. Okay, you don't have to. Matt, what's the start. question again? What's a, what's a favorite moment from the last month? I cleared my comprehensive. Not there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the favorite thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's enough. <laughs> that's going to be hard to top. <laughs> Ruth? Because I was improving further the model that I'm using, I finally found the algorithm and my model is working. I think I could finally find a way to analyze the data for my first experiment, and now I could uh, finish my first paper. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just got the significant result after um, I have done tons of tests for the GWA study so that uh, I have some results. Um, since starting the 3MT competition, my project went from 50 varieties to 300 varieties, which <laughs> allows us to like add the genetic element on, which could potentially give some really cool results. Okay, for me, the most important thing I've learned through this is that um, I've learned how to um, cut down details and try to make everyone relate to things that you do. Yeah. Um, for me, it's also I just passed my comprehensive exam yesterday. Woo! Woo! <laughs> um, as of Right now, I'm officially halfway through my experimental evolution stuff, so I'm pretty happy about that. From this 3MT journey, I really liked it. When um, Ingrid told me to not lunge to the front of the room before I start speaking, but rather to walk gracefully. So I feel like I've come out a better person from that. <laughs> Any questions emerging from our audience? Margaret, do you have any words of wisdom to share? Having seen now s six years, seven years, when I introduced Margaret, Margaret introduced me to the Mac Campus 3MT, I think six or seven years ago now, a while, and it's, it's been a remarkable journey. Yeah, 
It's nice to be in this room. It's nice to have media services here filming us professionally. It'll be nice for all of you. Thank you all for coming. The judges will be back soon, we hope. Although I do think, like, would anyone want to be a judge right now? Because I know I wouldn't. <laughs> this, seems like it, this seems like a very hard thing to judge. <laughs> anyone from the audience want to share any observations about the event? The HVAC system is working, <laughs> but it's not having to cool. Well, we had our orientation service started here in September, and it was freezing. We were freezing after being here for an hour and a half. So I guess now that it's almost December, the heating is on, so we're actually comfortable. <laughs> the heating, we all know now the heating is a little less complicated. Exactly. <laughs> I had a question um, for two of the um, presenters who did, are doing field work. I think there are two of you. There's the you, and are you also doing field work in an actual field? <laughs> okay. I just wanted to know where your field sites are located. Mine's at the Mac farm. So we're gonna have the same field site for three years. So hopefully at the end of the three years, we can actually measure soil carbon. The problem is with it being such a short project, we're kind of having to find other ways to do that that are gonna let us measure it in a shorter time frame. So I'm working on historical data sets from three year study, 2017 to 2019. And I have three sites, one in Quebec, actually here at Mark, and the experiments were run concurrently, and the one in Truro, the Nova Scotia is Truro site, and then for Ontario is Hero site, and I'm looking at corn crop rotation under different types of manures, that is, could be liquid and swine, and even biosolids. I'm interested in the safety protocol working with Legionella, because <laughs> that seems like something that we need to be careful working with, and I imagine you are, but um, yeah, you maybe you can to talk a little bit about it. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the good news is it's a respiratory pathogen, so like, as long as we're not, and you have to breathe it in with water. So if you're not putting it in like a spray bottle, you're pretty much fine. Um, but yeah, you know, lab coats, gloves, you're careful. I work a lot in our biosafety cabinet. Um, but that's not because I'm worried about me. I'm more worried about my cultures getting contaminated. Um, but yeah, you just got to be careful. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. But I'm kind of used to it now, right? So I don't, do you want anything to add to that? <laughs> do you guys have anything to add too? <laughs> Yeah, no, you're also not generating any aerosols with what you're doing, so no chance of breathing in the bad, bad droplets. No chance of the bad droplets getting in our HVAC system. No, very <laughs> low. So we talked about trying to give up some details in our talks so that people could understand the overall kind of narrative space of it. What's one detail that you had to give up that you wished you could have kept? So in the writing space, we talk about cutting your darlings, meaning you have some things that you really do want to share and they are really cool and interesting, but they're actually not necessary and we have to Snip, snip, and let those go. 
So one of the things I'm interested in is what did, what did I force you to snip <laughs> that you wish you could have shared? Yeah, sure. So um, it would be too, you didn't ask me to snip it, but it'd be too much of a handful to use the full word for the sleeping bacteria, which is viable but non-culturable. And I just think it's useful to know that word for if you want to read about more bacteria that are going into that state. But I didn't want to keep repeating that over and over and over, and sleeping's a lot easier. And so, yeah, just so now you know that term for if you're interested for more. Um, well, I had mostly like what I call frilly bits that I had to cut. They weren't that important, but I did cut some stats. Um, so what I cut on Monday night was that uh, when I said Legionella is increasing worldwide, I mean like in Canada, it's, in, it's increased over 326% between 2010 and 2019. So for me, it was, I'm also checking it with high heat treatment because it's, it's also a common method used for Legionella control. So like I didn't share that here today in my talk. Okay, so for me, I had to cut off the part that um, my digital version would go through different and several ways because it had some form of blockades it gets to at some point and there are different ways to address them, but I had to just switch them away and just assume it works so that you people get it, yeah. I had to cut some of the details I had in about how our like breeding and selection cycles work that I think quite nicely illustrate just like how little we know about plants when we're selecting them. It's just like, that one looks nice. It's not fallen over. It's not super green. I'll take it. Like zero information about it's like physiology, it's metabolism. We don't know what's happening below the ground. Um, I think, yeah, it would have been nice to illustrate that. Um, I had to change a couple of ways to uh, get people engaged at the beginning of the talk instead of, you know, raise your hands up and down, up and down, and then we're like spending too much time on that part. So we have changed three, couple, four ways to do that. Yeah. I think I didn't cut anything. I was on two, f <laughs> I was on 240 when we practiced and you asked me to add some experimental design and then to, should it be like around three minutes? There's always an exception. <laughs> well, I didn't have to say my model in full. DNDC is denitrification decomposition. The first time I mentioned it to Andrew was like, oh, that's too complex. <laughs> I can say everything. <laughs> and it was just a drop that I my experiment. And then when I talked with Andy and all about thermodynamics and phase change, and he was like, no. Just make it more simple. And even when I make it simple, he said that, no, even more simple. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was really hard to talk about all thermodynamics rules and physics and phase change with people and why we could save energy in this system and even about the nature of this ice crystal. So, yeah, it was a bunch of them it's removed. <laughs> No need for questions. I've opened it up for commentary now. So does anybody, would anyone like to hear from everyone about something that, do you have a more general? I have a question for veggie burgers. Oh, veggie burgers. Yes. Just a very general question. I don't know if you were inspired because you personally also dislike, you know, the veggie burger compared to the meat burger? No. Okay, so I like meat, but I also like vegetables. But I'm inspired more of the vegans so that they will feel inclusive. Because um, most times at our dinner parties, um, they are left out to munch on the peas and the green leafy vegetables while we tear our techie and enjoy. So if they could also at least feel that meaty taste, because it's really sumptuous. Meat is quite sumptuous. So I agree. Yeah. 
but does it have to be the same? Like, why does it need to be the same as actual meat? Can it not be just be different and be good as well? Okay, so it's not about the same taste, but a better, like a good taste. So um, I'm not trying to mimic the meat, but I'm trying to target the things that causes the bad taste. So if you can release them, then it would have a good taste so that they would also enjoy meat. Yeah. So by taste, you mean texture, flavor? Okay. Yeah, so they try to mask it out by adding some spices and some texturizers, but it makes it worse. So I am trying to remove what causes that bitterness and also try to work, as you said, with the texture. The protein isolates are not able to bond well with the other ones. So when they get in your taste buds, they try to disaggregate. And that also causes that unpleasant taste. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We'll get it. There we go. We get the whole audience with a drum roll. All right. So we're going to send the presenters back to the chairs on the side. We're going to turn these mics off. I think. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, everyone. Thank you, judges, for deliberating and uh, choosing first and second and third place. I, will, uh, I would now like to introduce Dr. Alice Sarestas, Associate Dean Academic and the Director of the Office of Student Academic Services, to announce the winners of the 2023 competition. Thank you very much, everyone, and um, amazing presentations. This is honestly the first time I'm uh, here, and I am super impressed. Um, it was, um, I, I absolutely loved it, loved it and uh, congratulations to everyone. And now we will start with um, People's Choice Award goes to Arusha Fleming from LULAB. And we have the third place award goes to Tong Zumeng from Nielsen Lab. Sorry. Congratulations. We have second place goes to Jillian Cameron from Fauché Lab. Thank you. 
congratulations. And we have the first place winner, Metap Singh from the Singh Lab. Congratulations. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sherestas. Uh, big thank you to our competitors. One last round of applause. If you enjoyed this event, good news, there is a McGill-wide 3MT competition taking place this spring. So as audience members, I welcome you to attend. As students, if you want to compete again or for new students, it's open to everyone. There is a link if you want more information. And thank you to everyone. Thank you so much again to our judges. Thank you to Andrew for emceeing the event. Thank you to our competitors, our wonderful technicians who made all of this event possible. Uh, we'd like to thank again Mrs. Lister and family for their support, the Lister Initiative, and everyone here and at home for attending. We truly appreciate it. Have a lovely evening. For those in person, if you want to stick around, talk to the